There's no intro needed. Let's just get into this damn thing. Let's go. Welcome to Two Cents Worth. It's your host, Ryan Favor. I am fired the fuck up right now. Woo, boy. It is, what time is it? It is 8 o'clock on Sunday night, the 24th of March, and I just got finished watching Duke and UCF, and if you've been listening at all over the last episodes or the entire time, you know I'm a Duke basketball fan, and that was a little too much for my heart to take. I was texting with buddies, and uh, basically it was that I felt like I was going to have a fucking heart attack. Oh, man, it's... um. It is exhausting. I'm. Uh, I feel like I'm spent uh, after watching that game. Like I just want to go to bed. But the adrenaline's pumping too much to where I can't go to bed. And also, I can't leave you all the the fans hanging uh, because the ratings are in, people. The ratings are in, and uh, I have been named the number one podcast. <laughs> in my neighborhood heard it here first folks it's not it's because of you it's not because of you it's because of you the listeners that the ratings are so high number one in my neighborhood that's right so in uh celebration i'm having a uh, copperhead my uh, my drink of choice here recently a little vodka some ginger ale nice little twist of lime at the end of it <whistles> nice wonderful refreshing drink Uh, Also, to calm the nerves from uh, the basketball game. Uh, A lot of good games. You know, we we went out yesterday with our friends, the Chastains, and we were uh, watching the games and without kids and having a couple drinks and just talking about the tournament. And there's a couple blowouts yesterday, but overall, the tournament has been really good. If you've been watching it and and been a part of uh, any of the viewings, it has been a, or if you're following your favorite team, it's been a really good tournament i think there's there's what we all expect every year is that there's going to be upsets in the first round and there were and uh some teams are going to advance that you're not expecting them to advance and that's going to be tonight so tomorrow morning when you listen to this or whenever you're listening to this it'll already be decided but there is a game oregon and uc irvine a 12 versus 13 12 versus 13 uh one of those two teams is going to move on. A 12 or a 13 seed is going to move on into the Sweet 16, which is what you always have. One of those types of teams will always make the Sweet 16, it seems like. Um, so good good for the tournament, good for the ratings, good for the fans. Even if uh, your team lost to one of them, Kansas State or um, – who lost Oregon, Wisconsin, and you got Liberty. They beat Mississippi State. They're a 12 seed. So there's some good uh, upsets in that first round. And, um, you know, even if your team did lose, you know, that's unfortunate and all, but the tournament still has a lot of good games to go. And um, it's going to be hopefully uh, continuing to be good. And that, you know, the blowouts are, I'm watching one right now, Texas Tech and Buffalo. And Texas Tech is kind of running Buffalo out of the court which I thought Buffalo was going to be better, uh, to be honest with you. I think I have them winning this game. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll lose on that one. But uh, let me put my phone on vibrate here while we uh, we look at it. Yeah, so let's. I'm going to pull up my bracket from last week. Uh, let's see. So in the East, right now, I have... Three out of the four, Virginia Tech and Liberty are at a half, and Liberty's beating Virginia Tech, but I have Duke and Virginia Tech and LSU and Michigan State playing in that. So my Sweet 16 over there is not that bad. In the West, I had Syracuse beating Gonzaga. Unfortunately, Syracuse didn't even get out of the first round, but I did have Florida State beating Murray State, and Florida State beat the shit out of them yesterday. And then in this one, I did have, I said Texas Tech and Buffalo. I had Buffalo playing Michigan, so I'm going to lose out on that game. So in the West, I got two out of four. Out of the Sweet 16, uh, and then tonight you'll we'll find out about Virginia and Oklahoma and Oregon and Irvine. But on the bottom half of that bracket in the South, I had Purdue and Tennessee. So 
I'm still looking pretty good. And then in the top hat or in the Midwest, I had North Carolina. I had Kansas beating Auburn. I didn't think Auburn was going to win. They did. And I got Kentucky and I got Houston beating. Uh, I thought Iowa State, but it's going to be Ohio State. So Houston versus Ohio State. So still, still some good games out there. Uh, my bracket's not completely not busted yet. So still have all my four final four teams in it, which is always good. All right. So, uh, I have a couple things I wanted to go through today. And the first one was the basketball because it just ended for, for my team. And now I'm still watching some games while I record this. Um, but, uh, I wanted to talk about that. I want to talk about Ichiro. It's springtime. Running program, if you follow along with any Instagram or Facebook, or I'm on Tumblr and Twitter as well. I put all my posts on all of those uh, four platforms. If you follow along on any of those, you'll see running program that I've uh, completed, and uh, I have an announcement on what's next. Shocking to my own self uh, because of just my initial disdain towards running, but I am enjoying the... Um, changes to uh my appearance and obviously that has to do with diet as well but um uh you know the running and the cardio on top of the the lifting has certainly helped reach uh help me reach my goals that I want to accomplish so we're going to get into and let me grab my computer and a quick drink I bet that sounded weird. All right. Okay. So this came up this week, and I wanted to talk about it because I thought it was, um, it's really an, <clears throat> uh, an end of an incredible career for somebody who, in athletics and even baseball in general obviously because he was a baseball player but even in overall athletics the the thought of players coming to America from overseas you know a lot of them have done it there was people before him there's people after him but he is somebody that actually was some that um succeeded and excelled and there are a lot that succeed and that do excel i think of people like Dirk Nowitzki uh, the Gasol brothers in uh, the NBA, baseball, you have Ichiro, you had Hideki Matsui for the Yankees, um, and a couple other players that have come over from overseas. Uh, but Ichiro Suzuki, this guy, if you know anything about him, he played 28 seasons in top professional baseball between the Japanese League and Major League Baseball, um, which is incredible. So he started his career in Japan, and he made the decision to move over to Major League Baseball. So he made his debut. He was born in 1973. He's 45 years old, and he retired this week. That's why I'm bringing it up. He retired this week. Uh, the opening opening games for the Mariners and Oakland Athletics were in Japan. So, what better fitting way for Ichiro Suzuki to retire, but in his home country, playing back for the Seattle Mariners? So, uh, we'll go through a, a portion of this is going to be about him and my thoughts on the Hall of Fame. Obviously, he's going to get in, but. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that because it did come up in conversation during the game. I was, I was lucky enough to watch the game because it was on early morning, um, and got to see him play his last game, which was kind of cool, uh, because you know, it, it is part of history and, and for me, baseball history, which is really important. So 1973, he was born in 1992. He made his debut for the Oryx blue wave. That is, um, of the Nippon, Nippon Professional Baseball, NPB, in Japan. That's where he began his career. And so that was in 1992, all right? So made his professional debut in 1992 in the Japan League. Again, remember, he played 28 seasons. He didn't come over to Major League Baseball until, until 2001. So 
he played nine years in the J- Japanese league before he even made the jump to Major League Baseball. You know, that's another thing in itself. He had an entire career. I mean, most guys don't, you don't even get nine years. Like, a, a career is four six years if you're lucky if you if you remember you go back to one of my earlier podcasts i believe it was episode two with daniel bard he only played a few years in the majors you know i mean it it, the lifespan of a major league baseball player is is never really too long and for for the ones that do make it that long you know that's where when you talk about the longevity of it and the skill and the adaptation and then also, you know, afterwards, the Hall of Fame, everything, that w- what goes into the player. But April 2001 is when he made his debut with the Seattle Mariners. So he played with the Seattle Mariners from 2001 until 2012. Then he moved over to the New York Yankees and played for the Yankees from 2012 to 2014. Went to the Marlins from 2015 to 2017, and then back with the Mariners for a portion of last year, and then to start this year. So he retired, what's today, the 24th? Three days ago. And I'm going to read the stats from both leagues to, to show you how good this guy is as a professional baseball player. One of the best hitters of all time. Without a doubt, without question. His stats for the nine years that he played in Japan, he aver- his batting average was 353. Unheard of in professional baseball. Now, they say the Japanese league is like the equivalent of your AAA for baseball. So for, for you baseball um, novices, the people that don't really follow along with baseball, think of your AAA, your minor league system. That would be the equivalent of what the Japanese is, Japanese league is. But still. Batted 353 in nine years. He had 1,278 hits. He hit 118 home runs. 529 runs batted in. He scored 658 times, so runs. And he had 199 stolen bases. This is nine years. Then he makes the jump to Major League Baseball. A harder league. In his, what is it, 2001 to 2000 can't really say 2019 because he only played two games. So let's say 2018, really. In his 17 years, right? Is that is that right? I said he played 28 years. Uh, hold on. I mean, 1992 to, to 2000. I mean, I guess they're considering this as a year. All right, anyways. In that time frame as a Major League Baseball player, he batted 311. So in, in baseball terms, in, in today's age, and really any in, in anything in baseball wise, if you if you have a career batting average of over 300, you're successful. So think about that in, in baseball. Three out of ten, you're considered a potential Hall of Famer. If you have a long career, if you can bat over 300 in Major League Baseball, you should be somebody that they would consider for the Hall of Fame. So compare that to other jobs, right? If you if you succeed only three out of ten times, you're considered a Hall of Famer at your job. That'd be incredible, huh? You imagine the lack of productivity that we would have as a society if that was our uh, barometer. So anyways, 311, he batted. He had over 3,000 hits. So again, in Major League Baseball, if you're going to look at this and you're going to look at the Hall of Fame, if you have 3,000 hits, it is basically a guarantee guarantee you're in the hall of fame unless you're pete rose we and that's a different topic of conversation because pete rose should be in the hall of fame i don't care what he did off the field the hall of fame should be the the judgment of what you did on the field and on the field he was one of the best players of all time side note back to ichiro 3089 hits in major league baseball on top of the 1,278 hits he already had as a professional in another league. 117 home runs, so Major League Baseball, harder league, so he's not going to hit as many home runs. Seattle, where he played, was not a uh, hitter's-friendly park 
it is a pitcher's park, and by that it means it's a very big field. Not one to be known for players to go and hit a bunch of home runs out. So you wouldn't expect them to hit a lot of home runs. 780 runs batted in, so RBIs. He scored 1,420 times runs, and he stole 509 bases. In his career, overall, he played for Oryx Blue Wave, Seattle Mariners, New York Yankees, Miami Marlins, and then back to Seattle. So four teams in his long career. And now let's go back to the stats and why what I'm going to talk about at the end and why I think everything here that I'm naming is why my opinion at the end of this I think will be right. And maybe another player before him will also get it because it happened once already. First time ever happened this year in regards to the Hall of Fame. Japanese League. Seven-time All-Star. Three-time MVP. Seven-time Gold Glove Award winner. Seven-time Best Nine Award, which would be the best nine players in the league. Three-time Matsutaro Shoriki Shoriki Award. I'll look that up. Three-time Japan Professional Sports Grand Prize. Seven-time batting champ. He was a stolen base leader in 1995, RBI leader in 1995, and they won the Japanese series in 1996. So let's see what this Matsutoro he is named in honor of Matsutoro Soriki, whose achievements earned him the label of the real parent of present-age Japanese professional baseball. The prize was founded in 1977. It is presented to a person, a manager or a player. Oh, it can be a manager, too. Who greatly contributed to the development of professional baseball. A gold medal and the prize of 5 million yen are awarded to the recipient. The prize money is provided by Yumiyuri Shimbun and some television station. So... He won that award three times, 1994, 1995, and 2004. Which is kind of funny because he wasn't in the league in 2004, but they still gave him the award because, again, it's about the development of Japanese baseball. So him being the face of Japanese baseball, even while he was in Major League Baseball, that's how important of a player this guy is. Major League Baseball, 10-time All-Star. So all in, he was a 17-time All-Star between the two leagues. AL MVP in 2001. AL Rookie of the Year. So he was the MVP and the Rookie of the Year in 2001. 10-time Gold Glove Award winner. 3-time Fielding Bible Award. 3-time Silver Slugger Award. Commissioner's Historic Achievement Award in 2005. 2-time AL Batting Champ. And the AL Stolen Base Leader in 2001. Let me tell you something about his 2001 season. Holy shit. All-Star. MVP, Rookie of the Year, Gold Glove Award winner, Silver Slug Award winner, AL Batting Champ, and the AL Stolen Base Leader. I would love to go back in time and watch the highlights of that season with Ichiro Suzuki. His first year in the league and the impact, the immediate impact that he brought to the international stage for baseball. The Seattle Mariners, which any team... Or any league that has a Seattle team, and, and my brother and sister in law live out there, and, and you know, I, I, I would say I'm saying this not as a knock to their city, but it is really far away from a lot of the other cities that participate in major league sports outside of hockey, where you have Vancouver, but they don't have hockey in Seattle right now. They're going to soccer. They do. They have Seattle and Vancouver and Portland. So you have a cluster of sports teams in that in that Northwest region of Canada and the United States. But for a lot of the other leagues, football, baseball used to be basketball. That is a long way to go. That is a very isolated part of the country when it comes to professional sports. So to be out there in Seattle and to make that type of impact, the impact of the city had to be tremendous. The excitement for the team had to have been tremendous during his stint there. You know, brought the excitement back to Seattle where, 
you had Ken Griffey Jr., you had Randy Johnson, you had Alex Rodriguez, you had these players before him that brought that excitement and then they were gone. And then, you know, who was going to bring that excitement back to the city? Uh, because your games are always on late. Your closest rival is Oakland, which is with how big California is, it's almost basically two states away because you got to go through Oregon and then a half of fucking California to get to Oakland. Uh, your division is Oakland, Anaheim, Houston, Texas Rangers. So two teams in Texas, two teams in California, and then all the way up in Washington. So again, like I'm talking about, it's an isolated part of the, the country, not in terms of population, but in terms of professional sports and just how far and how long it takes to get there and, and everything else. So for him to come in there in, in 2001 and have that type of year had to have been absolutely incredible for baseball, for the international scene, for Japan, for him as a professional, for the Mariners, for the city, the economic you know, people wanting to come and watch him play, um, just a crazy impact for him. Uh, let's see. MLB records that he has: two hundred and sixty-two hits in a single season, so that's an ML, a major league baseball record. Ten consecutive two hundred hit seasons, most hits by a Japanese-born player, most hits in interleague play, and most hits in a season by a rookie. And he is the all-time hits leader with 4,367 career hits. That's a hell of a career. Um, and I'm talking about it because of just, again, the, the impact of this guy and you watching him and you, and you watching him and you watch him for these amount of years that he was a professional. It's not like he played 15, 16 seasons in Major League Baseball. He did that on top of having another career in a different league prior to that. That's incredible. That's insane to think about that. It, it, absolutely. I, don't, I mean, I'm, almost, I'm at a loss for words. Now, to the Hall of Fame, because this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, and my thoughts on it. So it came up that, you know, the conversation as he was retiring in that last game was, okay, hey, what is going to happen to him um, from a Hall of Fame perspective? He's obviously in, right? There's no argument there. He's in the Hall of Fame. Hold on one second. I'm putting my computer down and grabbing my drink. He's in the Hall of Fame. But... Is he unanimous? The first person ever to be unanimous, Mariano Rivera, happened this year. Then it came up, will Derek Jeter, will he be unanimous? The argument came up there. Ichiro, will he be unanimous? I'm going to say one thing. This is me as a baseball fan. There's no bias here whatsoever because it is strictly baseball. If you all, if you have a vote... For the Hall of Fame. If you're a writer or anybody that has a vote for the Hall of Fame. If you don't think, after reading all of that and looking at all of that and looking at the impact that he has made, if you do not think that Ichiro Suzuki is a first-time Hall of Fame ballot player, then you should get your Hall of Fame credentials revoked because you're a fucking idiot. You're a fucking idiot. That guy, what I just read, that is some of the most incredible shit that you could ever imagine as a professional athlete. And if you are going to sit here in five years, and we have five years to think about this, if you sit here in five years and say, eh, no, nah, I didn't do enough for me, then you should get your fucking ass kicked and you should get your credentials removed because you don't know shit. And you don't know shit about baseball then. And you're a pompous fucking prick and you're an asshole and you're an embarrassment to the institution of baseball. And that's my opinion. So, that's my thoughts on Ichiro. I did want to talk about that. Again, this segment is always, as always, was sponsored by Thomas Lee. Huge baseball fan. 
monster baseball fan. Loves the stats of it, loves the game, loves the conversation. Thank you, Thomas, for the contribution, as always. All right, so, again, if you follow me on Instagram or any of my social media platforms, you saw that I was outside today. I had the boys out with me. Uh, A beautiful day here in the southern part of the country, in my lovely city of Charlotte. Low 70s. I got the hitting net out for golf. I was hitting some golf balls. We had the boys in the backyard. We were playing uh, baseball. Nolan was hitting some golf balls. Harrison was had the water gun out. We played some baseball after dinner as well. Nolan went on a bike ride. It, it is, this is what I have been waiting for for weeks and months, really, because the winter here, again, I've talked about it in the past, past conversations on this but the winter here has kind of sucked it's been rainy you know you can deal with the cold but when it's rainy you can't go outside you know and it's a it kind of sucks the dog was out he's out next to me passed out right now because he actually got to get some exercise in today but you know great weekend to have the kids out and really enjoyable and it just it just makes you happy as an individual to be outside and i didn't mind missing some of the games which you know some of the basketball games I missed portions of the Duke game because Harrison wanted to hit um, the baseball, which, again, you know, as a father, I want to be out there with my kids and I want to enjoy athletics with them because of how important it was to me in my life growing up and still is today. And so, you know, we just had a really good time outside, enjoyed a couple of cold beverages. I had a couple beers, and now I'm having this wonderful vodka drink to end the night. But um, what a depending on where you live in the country and depending on where you live in the world now is some of the nicest times in this part of the country uh in this part of the state before it gets really really hot and humid early spring to mid spring is really really nice and enjoyable here in charlotte to where you can be outside and i was outside shorts and a t-shirt but i didn't sweat i wasn't like drenched and dehydrated anything like that it was enjoyable to be out i got some yard work in as well and it was just a good uh good day good way to end the weekend going strong into the week in the work week and i and i hope for anybody listening to this if it's on your commute monday morning and i think tomorrow it might rain so uh but i hope you got to enjoy some nice weather i hope you had an enjoyable weekend we did a lot more than we have in the past because Again, the the weekends have been tough with the rain and everything, but Lindsay and I got out with our friends yesterday, got a couple of drinks and dinner with them, um, watched basketball, we were out with the kids on the weekend, Nolan had a t-ball game yesterday, and we got to enjoy the weather today, yard work that needed to be done got in, and just an overall enjoyable weekend, and let me tell you, it makes a hell of a difference to start your week after you had a good, enjoyable weekend. I'm going to tell you that. And and I'm feeling good. Uh, and I got my 10K run in yesterday. And if you've been following along on, on here and on Instagram and my other social media platforms, I keep on having to say that. Uh, but if you've just been following this, I started an eight-week program uh, of running. And again, if you know anything, I'm not an over overly big fan of running, but I've, I've come to enjoy it because of the transformation that I'm seeing uh, overall from a endurance perspective, strength perspective, look, everything, you know, I'm meeting the goals that I wanted to, that I set forth when I started this. And, um, you know, it was really nice to run yesterday with the sun out and blue sky and it was nice and it wasn't hot, but it wasn't cold either. And it hadn't been raining because there are some weekends where I had long runs where I'm running in the rain or I'm running in the cold and it had just rained and it was wet and, you know, you just kind of dreading it, like, oh, let's just get this shit over with. Like, yesterday, it was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to go into this and have a good run, and I'm going to enjoy it, and I did. And um, so, uh, you know, I got to I got that in, and the last time I had run a 10K was when I was 31 years old, so I'm 34, turning 35 this year, and I ran it in 50-33, and this year, and it was an actual race. So let me tell you, running in a race and then running by yourself – to your own time is a lot different running in a race your adrenaline's going you have people that you can you know you're visually trying to catch and run against and anything like that running by yourself it is basically you versus the clock and your own mental game of okay like i i had no 
reason to finish in any time perspective other than just for my own goal in my own head and and that's that's hard that's hard to push yourself especially when things start to hurt or you know i have a blister on the bottom of my foot that started coming back uh painful around mile three and a half and so you know i still had another three miles to go a little less but um you know it's hard to sit there in your own head and battle mentally and I feel a lot ment- a lot more mentally strong now than I did eight weeks ago just because of the fact of what running does do to you mentally. It, it does force you to go to sometimes some dark places in your in your mind to say that your body can do this and that your mind's telling you no, but your body's sitting there going, no, we, I think we're fine. You know, you just keep going. Just don't stop. Just don't stop. You stop, you fail. Don't stop. Don't stop. So just mentally stronger, but uh, yeah. So 31 years old, I, I ran it in 50:33, and I thought I was in good shape then. And um, now 34, going on 35, I ran it yesterday in 46:22. So I made a more than a four minute improvement on my overall time, and it was 6.2 miles, 10k. Um, and it was by myself. So again, it is me versus myself and my own goal and my own desire to finish in a certain time frame um and i think i told my buddy matt that i wanted to finish it somewhere under 48 minutes so i did so 46 22 so a minute and a half less than what i would have been happy with as 48 minutes um but right before mile two i'm on the sidewalk i'm running and i have i i look up and i'm trying to just kind of just get through you know i got the music playing I'm in good stride and everything. I look up and there's a guy about 100 yards ahead of me on a bike. And I'm not thinking anything of it. And not two seconds after I see this dude, I drag my foot a little bit. I guess I didn't get it up enough. And (laughs) the sidewalk uh, in front of me had raised up a little bit. And I caught my left foot and I busted my fucking ass. So this dude is riding his, riding his bike on the sidewalk. So my initial thought is this bucker better get off the sidewalk. Because first off, he shouldn't be on a bike on the sidewalk. We have a bike lane. There's a bike lane on the road I'm on, literally right fucking next to him. And I'm riding and I'm running towards him. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, this fucker better get off the sidewalk. And I bust my ass and I tumble over onto my right side. So I hit my palms on the ground, which that at the time was the only thing that hurt. So I bust my ass. I fall on my palms to try and catch myself and I kind of I roll down over my right side so down onto my right elbow right shoulder roll right over and pounce right back up and keep running like I didn't even stop it was just like just get back up and run just run like oh fuck like what the fuck just happened and the guy on the bike just just rode right by me acted like nothing happened didn't even look at me didn't ask me if i was okay he probably thought i was a fucking psycho because he's like holy shit the dude just fucking fell and he bounced back up like what the fuck like did he do it on purpose or was that a joke what the fuck yeah okay i'm just gonna ride by him i'm all right i'm riding by him i'm riding by him don't look at him don't look at him don't look at him all right all right he's gone he's gone what the fuck was that that's all i could think of of this what this guy was doing And literally, as I get up, my watch vibrates for mile two. And I was like, fucking hell, I got four more miles to go. I'm like, my fucking hands hurt. I'm a little embarrassed. There was cars that drove by. Nobody fucking stopped. Nothing. And and because of how, how quickly it happened, then the other thought that I had when it happened was, well, fuck, man, I hope I don't lose any time. Like, really? You stupid fuck? Like, you could be bleeding right now. Or you could have gotten concussed, or your fucking hand could have broke, your hand, fingers could have broke, whatever it could have been. And all I was worried about is, ah, oh, man, hope I don't lose any time off of my pace. Like, that is also when I was like, son of a bitch, like, this is what real runners think about. Like, that's what I cared about at that moment was, oh, not that I'm hurt, not that I'm a little embarrassed, not that this fucking guy just, I just busted my fucking ass right in front of him, but my time. What was my, oh, I hope I don't mess up my time. But anyways, finished it strong, ended, came home, and I'm like, oh, I had a long sleeve shirt on. So I pull my shirt off, and my elbow is all busted up. So I got some Neosporin on, it's all scraped up. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not bad. I'm like, oh, that's my battle wound, whatever. 
So I cool down and I get in the shower and I, as I get in the shower, I see my reflection in the mirror behind me and I have a huge scrape on my right shoulder blade. So I'm like, oh shit, okay, well there's another piece from the, the run. And my shirt wasn't ripped. Nothing was ripped. So I don't know. I didn't know where any of this was. Like the uh, compression pants I had on, nothing was ripped there where I fell or anything. So I was like, all right, so my knees are good. My thighs fine, whatever, uh, which it all is. Um, but I could feel just burning in my elbow. And I was like, all right, well, obviously I'm scraped on my elbow, but not my back. My back doesn't hurt, but it's all scraped up. And then I'm washing in the shower, and I look down, and my ankle is just bloody. And I was like, oh, fuck, man. Like, So, like, my whole right side, from an- I got ankle, elbow, and shoulder is all scraped up from the run. My palms now aren't even that bad, even though my left palm will probably bruise a little bit because it's a little tender to the touch. But overall, not bad. But, you know, who says running's not a contact sport? Um, which leads me to my next and final thing. And, again, eight weeks of running. And I've seen, I'm going to keep saying it, just seen the results and um, the motivation that I've had. So I, and the program that I can't, I, I went on, went with was uh, from Hal Higdon. So it's H-A-A, H-A-L, Hal Higdon, H-I-G-D-O-N.com. And he ha- he has... Um, how many different training programs? He has a marathon training program, half marathon training, 5K, 8K, 10K, 15K, and 10-mile training, post-marathon training, base training, all these training programs. And under each training program, he has like novice, novice two, intermediate, expert. So this one that I did for the 10K was novice 10K. Um, And about how... I'll, I'll talk talk about Hal for a minute. So Hal Higdon began running as a student at the University of Chicago and continued running competitively at Carleton College in Minnesota, where he won several conference championships. After school, Hal competed eight times in the Olympic trials, notching his best finish at as fifth place in the 1960 trials in the 3000 meter steeplechase, which is where you jump the hurdles and you jump into the water and over the water, uh, all while on the track. In the 1964 Boston Marathon, Hal placed fifth overall and was the first American finisher with his time of 2 hours, 21 minutes, and 55 seconds. That's a marathon, by the way. His World Masters Championship M40 record of 918 in the steeplechase set in 1975 remains the oldest American Masters record in the books. Men's 40, M40. Uh, Hal is the contributing editor for Runner's World and is the magazine's longest-lasting writer, having contributed an article to Running World's second issue in 1966. He's also the author of more than three dozen books, including Marathon, The Ultimate Training Guide, and the recently published Hal Higdon's Half Marathon Training. So that's who he is. So I just found him by eight weeks ago. I just put in 10K training program and found his site. So I have uh, an announcement to make today. Only two people know that I'm going to do this. And and if it leads to an actual race at the end of all of it, we'll see. Uh, my timing is kind of a little bad because of how hot it's going to be at that point in time. But I have decided to do a 12-week program starting tomorrow. So uh, 12 weeks from tomorrow, March 25th. It is a half marathon training. And if you know me, the 10K is the longest race I've ever run. I've never run more than 6.2 miles. I did it yesterday, Saturday, and I did it three years ago when I was 31 years old. Other than that, I've never run longer than 6.2 miles. And I have decided to do the half marathon training. And I'm going to do, in this one, he has novice one, novice two, intermediate, intermediate two, advanced and uh, Half Marathon 3 or HM3, this is a new program, da, 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 whatever, and then Walkers. I have decided to do the Novice 1, keep it easy, keep it around what I'm doing already. Um, I had been doing already, which is basically you run three times a week and you do some cross training. So starting tomorrow, I go back down to a three-mile run. I have a two-mile run. 
this is my first week. I have a three mile run, a two mile run, a three mile run in consecutive days. Then I rest. Then I have a 30 minute cross training. And then my long run for that week is four miles. And then by the end of the 12 weeks, obviously, I will run a half marathon. That'll be my final run. Um, so I say that I have this big announcement. I, to me, this is a big announcement, and it's something that um, I'm a little nervous about. That I, you know, I, I worry that I'm gonna lose the motivation for it. So obviously, anybody that's interested in being a part of it or following along or trying it as well, please let me know. I think it would be great to have other people that follow along with the program that I'm I'm doing uh, because it definitely keeps accountability. Uh, if that's not your thing, but just making sure that you're holding me accountable, uh, through social media, through text message, whatever it is, however, the best way that you communicate with me is, um, which would, will be great as well. And I have a couple trips that kind of go into that as well. I have a golf trip coming up in May. Um, so that'll change my programming a little bit. And then I have a trip, uh, to the Dominican, the Caribbean in July. And that's basically how the program will end is, um, sometime in July. And the dog just jumped on me. Get off of me. There's a whole couch. Move. (sighs) Go over there. (sighs) So anyways, uh, I have a trip to Florida, uh, to see Lindsay's family. So, you know, it, it's going to be, um, making sure that I keep myself accountable and I'm going to have work trips, you know, things like that to where I'm going to probably have to run in hotels or around the hotel. If I'm not in, if I'm in New York, I'm not fucking running in New York city. No fucking way. Uh, but I'll run in the hotel, which is going to suck because treadmill running, I can't stand. It's so boring. Um, but anyways, accountability, if you want to join me and be a part of it, I think that would be awesome. I would really appreciate that if anybody would. And, and also to, to help you reach some goals for running, for weight, anything like that. So my goal at the end of March was to weigh 190. I'm down to 188. So I'm uh, uh, currently a little ahead of my goal, which is great. And I'm just trying to keep going and keep my diet going. And this is also going to help me with my diet. This dog's driving me nuts. Uh, help me with my diet. Because knowing that I have a run and everything, like I don't want to eat crappy food and feel shitty and, you know, cutting back on the booze has been helpful, even though I'm drinking tonight. But um, I've been drinking a lot more white liquor than I have beer in the uh, now than I have in the past. So um, I say all that. It's big news for me. It's something that uh, I never thought I would do. And I thought about it the other day and I was like, you know what? Let's just do it. Just fucking do it and see if you can do it. And if you can, you can mark that off that. You know, you've you've accomplished something that you never had any desire to do whatsoever, and um, yeah, so I'm excited about it, and uh, I hope that uh, again, like I said, I hope if anybody wants to hold me accountable or be a part of it, please let me know, and um, I certainly enjoy having others be a part of the uh, the journey, and if not, and if this is how you want to follow along. I will give updates on how it's going, especially when it gets to time to where I need to run longer runs. You know, the good thing is I kind of reset, go back to shorter runs, four miles shorter run, and work my way back up to what I just finished, which was six. So it won't be for a couple more weeks until I get, um, you know, seven, eight miles, which would be the longest longest miles I've ever run at a consecutive time. So um, all that said, that's what I have going on in uh my life right now and um again i want to thank everybody for making this the number one podcast in my neighborhood it's a huge accomplishment for myself uh as always rate it do the thing subscribe make sure you're listening tell others about it let's make this the number one podcast outside of my neighborhood in the two neighborhoods next to mine and maybe the street across the highway from us let's make this the number one podcast in My zip code. How about that? We'll start there. Got to start small before we grow big. All right, everyone. Have a great week. If I don't talk to you, which I might never because I don't know who you are. Some of you I do, but not everyone. Have a great week. Sun shining. Keep your head up. Enjoy your life. Talk to you soon.